I was going to chat about the weather here in Alberta and that it's rodeo season and I'm taking my kids to watch some bull riding tomorrow night. What's happening in your neck of the woods? Well, you know, Chris, it's actually recording right now. So we are, uh, all of this is, 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 is being recorded. So I I told no, I told no one in advance that we'd go easy on you as it's the first time you hosting the show. (laughs) Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Hi, welcome to Off the Record. I'm Chris Sims. I'm the Alberta Director for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Uh, We're here on True North and I'm going to, I think I just mentioned it, I'm going to be taking my kids to the rodeo uh, uh, tomorrow to watch some bull riding here in the beautiful city of Lethbridge. So we're gearing up into this moment of the end of summer. Sorry, I felt a little cool breeze this morning. I could sense pumpkins growing. Uh, So yeah, that's what we're heading into this weekend. What are you guys up to in your neck of the woods? No, uh, definitely nothing you. as exciting as bull riding. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, basement living. You know, it's great. How- well, I was gonna say maybe maybe Noah this weekend can do some uh, patchwork on his basement there and repair uh, what appears to be some holes in the ceiling. I'm glad it's not in frame right now, but uh, yeah, there's definitely <laughs> it a couple be a holes hole in the frame. Ceiling. Actually, now that I'm putting my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! Well, yeah. the, the problem is the no, ventilation no, in the plan. basement here sucks. Like the, <laughs> the, the like the I don't know the vents don't really work all that well. So my dad one day just came downstairs and cut a giant hole in my roof. I'm like, what are you doing? But uh, yeah, that was just there. <laughs> airflow. He's, he's providing you airflow. Uh, Harrison, what are you up to this weekend? Nothing. I may be going to uh, Ottawa actually tomorrow to do some work, a video project in the works, and uh, then I'm going to a friend's wedding on the weekend. So. No bull riding. Can't really do that in Ontario. Uh, but, uh, you know, other things are other, other things in the works. That sounds really nice. Going to a wedding sounds really nice. Are you popping by the CBC by any chance when you head to, to the capital? W- wasn't planning on it. No, I was going to actually try to avoid them as much as I, c- as much as I can. But, uh, you know, you never know if something good comes up. I might pop my head in and see what's going on. Well, if you go to buy some poutine on Spark Street or something, maybe they could come out and cover it breathlessly because at least that would be Canadian content. I wanted to bring this up because it was one of those things where I have a lot of Canadian friends and family who are now suddenly talking about the current U.S. vice president and what we're all assuming to be the presumptive nominee for the Democrats in the United States of America. They're all suddenly talking about Kamala Harris, like a lot like way more than I was expecting for like a VP, right? Even as far as our interest in American politics goes. And then I was seeing on True North that apparently more than 60 stories on Kamala Harris have been covered at the CBC. Like, I don't care about private broadcasting. Fill your boots. Talk about her all day. But here we go. Yeah, the CBC's Kamala Mania, as it is headlined, 68 stories on Harris campaign in just one month. So quick math. That's more than two a day. The reason why I've got an issue with this, of course, is because we want to defund the CBC because the CBC costs taxpayers $1.4 billion per year. And every time we tell them, you know what, you guys should really be defunded. This is a huge waste of money. They clutch their pearls and say, oh, my goodness, who would give out the maple syrup recipes? We're purely Canadian. Like, Noah, what went through your mind when you saw that headline? Well, I just thought like the people who try to justify the CBC's existence don't really have an argument that the CBC should be, you know, promoting American content, especially, uh, you know, skewing their coverage in order to coverage one presidential candidate over the another. I just went on, I just popped on the CBC's website before recording, and I saw that you know they're doing extensive coverage of the DNC. You know, they're talking about Kamala Harris and how to pronounce her name correctly uh and you know they're talking about michelle obama's you know fantastic speech and then the one story about trump is a negative story it's basically bashing his campaign for you know a mess up or whatever which is fine you know if president trump is you know, making a mistake and Kamala harris is making a mistake then go ahead cover it but if you're only covering donald trump's mistakes and not his triumphs and you're only covering Kamala Harris's triumphs and not her, you know, mistakes, uh, then you're you're really, you know, showing that you have a bias. And even though the CBC has a American bias, they shouldn't even be covering American politics to begin with. Uh, you have a lot of other uh, Canadian news uh, outlets who do just as good of a job, if not a better job, at covering American politics. And you have 
thousands uh, upon uh, thousands of media organizations in the United States that does a good enough job at covering their own cover uh, their co own country. Uh, the CBC's mandate is to cover Canadian uh, uh, topics. So uh, I think that uh, in my mind, uh, when the CBC they're publishing stories about Kamala Harris incessantly, I'm like, where is the stories about Justin Trudeau? Where is the stories about Jagmeet Singh and Premier Ford and the people who are actually in power in Canada uh, and, and the people that actually matter to Canadians, not just the, you know, the Americans who are, you know, doing their own thing, you know, good on them, but uh, they're not Canada. Yeah, that's a great point. It kind of reminds me of uh, what their prime, I don't know what their primetime stuff is like lately. I know that very few Canadians are watching it, but it reminds me back when I was a kid where they used to import American primetime shows in a desperate attempt to get people to watch Canadian, can the Canadian channel, even though it was American shows. I kind of have some sympathy for that, trying to get some eyeballs. But when it comes to actual news coverage, they always say, but who will defend Canada? They always bring it up as their founding mandate, which it was in language. In fact, CBC Radio was created back in the 30s and 40s in order, ostensibly, to thwart the big powerhouse radio stations coming out of places like CBS New York and Chicago. Those were some powerhouse radio stations and so all of a sudden, Canada was like, oh, we need our own soap operas. That's how it got started. Then they started covering the war, and then we were off to the races. Uh, Harrison, what did you think about that headline when you saw that Kamala Harris is getting more than 60 stories covered in one month on the Canadian broadcaster? Well, in contrast, Justin Trudeau was only mentioned 18 times in that same amount of time, in that, in that one-month period. So Harris gets 68 mentions, and Trudeau gets 18. And it's pretty obvious what they're trying to do here. But I want to show you some of the headlines for the coverage that they are that the CBC is pumping out uh, about Kamala Harris. You've got uh, you got this one here. Are, are Kamala Harris memes of coconut trees and Brat Summer part of her official campaign? Some extremely hard hitting journalism. Let's show you the next one here. What else do we have? Oh yeah, why is everyone going coconuts for Kamala? Remarkable why? stuff. It's, okay, it's, just it's, I need to I need to explain that to me like I'm six, Harrison. What what's with the coconut reference? Well, when she famously said, "Did you just fall out of a coconut tree?" They're trying oh. to make that seem as though that is you know that is one of Kamala Harris's great examples of her legendary oratory skills. We all know Kamala Harris is a, is is going to be in the pantheon of great public speakers. Falling out of the coconut tree is one of her greatest hits. So that's the origin uh, of that okay. particular meme. But again, going back to something Noah mentioned, which is the argument that we hear from the most loyal defenders of the CBC is that if there is no CBC, well, then there's going to be no local news coverage of, of rural areas in Canada. There's going to be no important coverage of in French language. Who's going to be reporting on the stories uh, on, on indigenous stories and, and stories in the far north? Well, this is a clear example that even that argument carries no weight because like I said at the very beginning, if Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, only gets 18 mentions in a month and Harris gets 68, imagine when they imagine how many times they mention the Manitoba premier or Danielle Smith or local pol political leaders that actually matter to Canadians. They don't. They don't care. So they're just basically in this in this game of trying to make Kamala Harris out to be this 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 figure that she is clearly not. And, you know, Canadian news be damned. That's uh interesting because the numbers back that up what you were just talking about there like covering indigenous stories covering local stories so number one um the ratings the rating share for cbc primetime is tiny so it's just over two percent so that means around 97 percent of canadians are choosing to not watch cbc news for primetime further if you want to drill down like you were mentioning local news about 1%, the last numbers we were able to find because they've started kind of making it a bit murky in their annual reports, about 1% of Canadians are tuning in to the CBC Supper Hour News. So I'm older than both of you gentlemen. Back when I was a kid, the six o'clock news was a big deal. Like people sat around and they they watched their TV, they watched their six o'clock news. That is about 1% now. So there, there goes your local. As far as the indigenous stuff goes, that's really interesting too, because again, always go back to the numbers and the data. As far as we can tell, CBC is spending more on their executive brass pay than they are on indigenous coverage. I had to go check that three times because I couldn't yeah. really believe it. 
like to use a comparison, like I watch APTN reasonably regularly. They do an outstanding job. They have a big investigative reporter team. They cover stuff all the time. I think they've got 11 indigenous languages that they report in. And they get a tiny fraction of taxpayers' money. It's really just a one-time thing where they have to have like their summer festival day that taxpayers contribute to. All the rest of the operations are paid for through their own money that they generate. So the CBC trying to use this argument of, oh, well, who will cover Indigenous culture? It doesn't stand up to scrutiny when you look at the actual numbers. With this kind of coverage given to Kamala Harris, we're entering the territory of Harris uh, having to give away some poutines to some of these CBC journalists. If you recall, that was the gift that Trudeau gave to David Cochran for near sycophantic coverage. Um, it looks like that now. Maybe it'll be a coconut coconut poutine concoction uh, will be <laughs> given to the CBC journalists for all of their very, uh, very helpful coverage for the Harris campaign. That sounds gross. I'm going to upgrade it a little bit. <laughs> Let's go with beaver tails, okay? Let's go right on the Rideau Canal. It's winter time. You're skating. It's a beaver tail. They could sprinkle coconut on there, <laughs> on a beaver tail, yeah. along with their to- or along, along with vanilla yeah. or cinnamon or something. Oh my gosh, that's a yeah, lot. I was I was quite surprised by those numbers. Uh, speaking of numbers, uh, did we want to move on to uh, Mr. Charles Adler being nominated for the Senate? Let's do it. So let's pull up the story. Everybody has heard the news likely already. It's a, it's the summer. It's quiet in Canada, unlike the United States. So Senate appointments really seem to uh, be breaking news in this country. And uh, Charles Adler was appointed by Justin Trudeau to be the next independent senator, a liberal senator. And that surprised some of the uh, some of, some of the people who knew Charles Adler before 2019, 2018, say when he when he was a conservative. He's now, of course, uh, far more progressive. You would even consider him to be, most people would consider him to be on the, pretty much on the far left at this point um, with what he has been tweeting about, the things that he's been talking about on his radio show. He has, uh, he's really kind of, well, he's a changed man. And he's going to change even more because he's just been appointed to sit in the Senate. And there have been some hilarious examples of Charles Adler, well, let's just say not being so independent. Let's show a couple of these examples here for the audience who are watching on YouTube and Facebook. We've got this quote here. PM Trudeau is comfortable at pride events because he's comfortable in his own skin, a self-confident Canadian. Why does Pierre Polyev not attend these events? Well, he's worried that the homophobes he panders to will barbecue him. Leaders lead, paranoids pander. You know, maybe it was that tweet that actually gave him the appointment, or maybe it was this one. People ask why I'm not supportive of Polyev. This is precisely why. Voted PC for most of my life, provincially and federally, but this is 10,000 miles from the center. I would feel ridiculous supporting a Canadian freak show just because it was, it has the word conservative in the brand. And uh, for those of you that are not looking at this, there was a picture of Polyev leaving a van with a tiny little diagonal sticker there, diagonal symbol. Uh, and of course, that means Pierre Polyev must be a diagonal member. Scary, scary diagonal. How about one more here? Well, it's a weird thing with Charles Adler, guys. He has this, well, let's just call it a crush on Sean Fraser. Uh, you know, let's see this tweet here. Canada watching new version of A Star is Born with Sean Fraser. Unlike Pierre Polyev, he doesn't need image consultants training him to look and speak like a genuine human being. Oh, easy there, Charles. Uh, you know, it's remarkable, guys. What a, what, what a, what a changed man. He's now going to be sitting as an independent senator. And he was once, believe it or not, a conservative with tweets like that. It's hard to believe. Chris, what do you think? Well, cards on the table. I've known Mr. Adler for a long time. Like, I'd have to really think hard because I was doing uh, hits on his show and booking him for my old radio shows back when he was in Winnipeg at CJOB uh, before Sun News Network ever got started. Uh, and then I worked with him from startup to shut down at Sun News Network. Um, just we got along great. Uh, he worked well with everybody as far as I know. Um, and then after Sun News Network was shut down, I did his radio show, his national radio show, at least once a week. And so I know a lot of my colleagues at the CTV did his show once a week. And I think it's, I, I'm giving all of this context because I think it's important for, for truth and facts. And so that is the way that things were before. Um, needless to say, there's been a remarkable change, uh, a really notable change. Um, so much so that even in the way he would describe people like that, like forget about the partisan, forget about ideology. 
just kind of describing a politician like that, like that wasn't really his jam. Like he might do that sort of thing maybe for Margaret Thatcher when really pressed and feeling like nostalgic, but not just your everyday minister. And so my takeaway from this as a taxpayers federation is that there's so many people who are now upset about this on both I would describe as the left and the right for different reasons. I think it highlights the idea that perhaps it's time to go back to a triple E Senate. So Preston Manning, Preston Manning, former uh, founder of the Reform Party, he wanted a triple E Senate. He wanted it to be equal, elected and effective. And that's probably a good idea. Uh, I'm going to defend the Senate a little tiny bit here, just a smidge when it comes to the idea of independent versus liberal versus PC and all that jazz. Um, the Senate in two separate occasions that I can remember in the last four years did tap the brakes on a couple of pieces of legislation that would probably be important to True North viewers. The one that sticks out in my mind, and I'm going from memory, so please forgive me, is during the Emergencies Act. So folks might remember, as far as I can recall, Emergencies Act was rushing through, went through the House of Commons, blah, blah, blah. The folks that hit the brakes on that, if I recall correctly, one of them was a Cretchen appointed liberal senator. To said, um, are we really sure about this? And now, of course, that we have the federal judge ruling, <laughs> survey says you shouldn't have done that and you guys overstepped your bounds and blah, blah, blah. So I can hear the argument for the idea of sober second thought. But man, when you've got one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars per year after six years of service, a huge pension, no way to recall people, it starts getting really unaccountable really fast. And I can see why people want to go back to Tripoli. E. Noah, did you want to get in on this? Yeah, I think my biggest problem with this story is the sort of deception of it all. I think that uh, when Charles Adler uh, declares himself as a conservative uh, to everyone who uh, you know knows what he believes nowadays, uh, he's clearly not a conservative. I mean, uh, the conservative party's leader, Pierre Polyev, you know, say what you will with it about him. I have some criticism about him, but he's clearly a conservative. He's believed in conservatism his entire life. If you read, you know, his old essay or whatever. Uh, but Charles Adler clearly isn't interested in conservatism, at least not anymore. And it's completely fine for your political beliefs to evolve over time. You know, my political, if your political beliefs don't evolve over time, you're probably an ideologue, right? Yeah. But the problem is, is that if your political beliefs evolve, you should change the uh, your label uh, to to correspond with your beliefs. For example, Charles Adler is not a conservative. He should probably call himself a liberal uh, or, you know, a centrist or something like that. Not a conservative. Clearly not a conservative. So uh, I think not only does that, that bother me a little bit, but also the fact that he's being appointed to a Senate group, uh, the independents, uh, that are mostly comprised of liberals or whether they're appointed by Justin Trudeau or appointed by uh, past liberal uh, liberal uh, prime ministers, which, uh, which for me, I think is deceptive because, uh, as was mentioned before, uh, these independent senators more, more times than not vote with the government. There are exceptions, uh, and usually ex these exceptions are come from uh, liberals uh, in, in um, from you know the Jean Chrétien era, era, for example, where the liberals were a bit more liberal, not illiberal, uh, like they are now. So it just seems like uh, Justin Trudeau is trying to deceive the Canadian public when he calls uh, these senators independent. Uh, they're clearly liberals, even though they don't caucus with the liberals. Uh, they sh clearly have. Uh, liberal values. I didn't want to say they have liberal values. They have leftist values. Um, so it's it's a bit deceptive uh, to call yourself an independent uh, senator when you vote along with the Liberal Party all the time. It's it's deceptive to call yourself a conservative uh, when you're bashing conservatives all the time and praising, you know, liberal minister Sean Fraser. Uh, and it's really does a disservice uh, to trust in Canadian institutions because when you know uh, Canadians see that these independent senators are not acting independently, when Canadians see that the senator Charles Adler, who self declares as a conservative, isn't you know voting in a very conservative manner, it undermines credibility in our institutions and the people that run them. I well, just wanted well, to note, I think yeah. I think the jury's still out. Aren't we still out on whether or not this will be confirmed? I thought I saw something about this is not yet confirmed, whether or not Mr. Adler will become a senator. Well, well I know that, uh, yeah, the, the Prime Minister's office, they sent out a press release saying that uh, Adler and the other senator, which we should probably get to, um, uh, they, they were uh, basically uh, confirmed by the Senate committee uh, that basically deals with appointments and the Prime okay. Minister uh, also announced it. So I think it's more or less a done deal. 
First Nation, the Manitoba First Nations leaders actually have criticized the appointment and have called on uh, on the government to rescind Charles Adler's appointment. So even even praising the liberals and praising the left like this has not managed to get him on the side of some of these uh, First Nations chiefs. But I do think we're being a little harsh on Charles Adler. After all, it's important to recognize that he is a self-proclaimed talk radio legend. Don't forget that. This is a famous, uh, famous Charles Adler tweet calling himself a legend, a talk radio legend. So, you know, it's important to, to, to make sure we give him, we give him his, his due as, as a legend. He is a legend amongst us, and maybe he will elevate the quality in the Senate and bring in more talk radio legend, uh, legendary moments. I wish I had that much self-confidence on myself, you know? <laughs> I don't know if you want to call that hubris or, you know, just some other devious word in the thesaurus, but uh, some, I'm definitely not going to. You're never going to see that on my Twitter. That's for That sure. one kind of surprised me, actually. I'm surprised <laughs> that that's up there. Um, all right. So did we, I wanted to stress that I think a lot of the pushback, apart from people who are political nerds or news nerds, all of us included, um, I think the average public is probably annoyed most about this because of the lack of accountability and the lack, like the lack of uh, cost effectiveness. I think a lot of people are still struggling right now. We still see record demand for food banks. I always check the MNP uh, bankruptcy numbers and where they ask people, how close are you to not being able to make your ends meet? 50%, half of Canadians are within 200 bucks of not being able to make their minimum payments. I'm not talking paying off your credit card or your line of credit. I mean, making your minimum payments and making rent and just enough to have food. Half? That's crazy. And so then when they see senators willy nilly making 175 grand plus expenses, like they get catered lunches, they get all these really fancy things on Parliament Hill. I think that really grinds people's gears. And so I think that's also why this is making news apart from him being of, I think, 30-something-plus-year-long broadcaster. So there's so much yeah. data, so many records on there. Yeah, Noah, you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah, just to add to your point, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. When Canadians see, like, you know, these centers making uh, these lavish paychecks, uh, it's not really <laughs> something that, you know, people can relate to, uh, especially when you're appointing senators that, you know, uh, over their lifetimes has uh, donated to the Liberal Party uh, thousands and thousands of dollars. And that's uh, the case with the uh, Senate appointee Tracy Mugley, who donated to the liberals over 220 times in her lifetime 221 times uh, to be specific between 2006 and 2020 uh, she donated uh, about eighteen thousand dollars over almost nineteen thousand dollars to the liberal party whether that's to her uh, local eda whether that's to the liberal party proper or in uh, various liberal leadership elections uh, some of the highest uh, donations that she uh, gave was uh, i think over a thousand dollars she also gave uh, almost a thousand dollars in non-monetary donations. So I guess like she's buying a lot of coffees for her liberal MPs or something like that. I, I don't really know. Uh, but yeah, these are the type of people that are being appointed to the Senate are and are going to sit as independents. You know, people who are lifelong liberals. Uh, th th this uh, woman actually ran as a liberal candidate in 2015 and 2019 not once but twice uh, you know she lost both times so i guess you know <laughs> trudeau had to like you know get uh, one of his own in there because uh you know she clearly couldn't do it uh, on the with the ba uh, backing of the canadian people uh but yeah i mean this is the type of these are the type of people that are being appointed to the Senate, people who have uh, uh, loads of money to just donate to political parties uh, and, you know, sitting as independents, even though they're clearly liberal partisans. I think that really erodes trust in our institutions, especially the uh, unelected Senate. It does. Well, and it's been yeah. going, this has been the like, standard operating procedure at the Senate now forever. Like it has been full of political party hacks, both blue and red. Like, and say. so, yeah, it's just not changing, is it, Harrison? No, I was just going to say that actually, that when, uh, when, when Justin Trudeau is eventually... Uh, ousted as prime minister and the government switches over to the conservative side, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to go to people who have donated the conservative party, who have been party loyalists for many years, failed candidates. It'll be the same thing. And, you know, it's uh, it's fun to criticize it now, but it will be topic of conversation for a show on the other side of the debate in a couple of years time when Pierre Polyev makes an appointment like this, but on the conservative side. So it's just going to be what it's going to be. And uh, I think it's fitting to end the end the show with uh, with this subject. We have our taxpayer uh, our taxpayer specialist hosting us, so this is like the taxpayer story right now in Canada. 
Chris, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, hopefully the next show will not involve any of my former colleagues or TV <laughs> hosts. But for some reason, it's like a blue light special on these folks. So Tom Clark, uh, I loved working with him. He was super nice to me. I worked with him for years at CTV. Um, he then, I think, went to global for quite a while. I kind of tuned out of mainstream media for quite a bit the last few years. He was at global for a long time. He is now the Canadian Consul General in New York City. And so for folks who are listening who are like, what is that exactly? It's kind of like a mini ambassador, okay? And we have some of these folks in key positions, to be fair, around the world. And New York City, definitely a key city still around the world. The problem here is that there's this residence slash office slash, like it's a map dot, okay? Imagine you're dropping your Google map dot right next to Central Park. Apparently it's been dubbed like Billionaire's Row or something like that in New York City. Yep. Last I checked, it was around $9 million for this pad. And this is what's really got people's eyebrows raising saying, really? $9 million? Why are we shelling out $9 million for the residence slash building crash pad for the New York Consul General for Canada? Here you go. Global Affairs Canada is, quote, very proud of $9 million New York City condo purchase, says Consul General Tom Clark didn't influence. OK, so that could very well be the case. This could all be bureaucrats deciding this sort of thing. Um, I would love to be able to privately pick Tom Clark's brain on this, on what he thinks about this, and if he said anything. Uh, a fun story, which wouldn't embarrass him at all. Uh, back when I was at CTV at the Bureau, uh, I used to say this dorky thing of, everybody should get together and go bowling. It was just a throwaway line. One Christmas, I figured, let's stop these boring office parties that everybody hates at Christmas time. Let's go bowling. And so we actually, the team of us, Bob Fife and Craig Oliver and everybody went bowling. And Tom Clark was like, bowling. Is that the sport where you rent shoes? And he said it in this great <laughs> anchor man voice. And so I would just love to actually have a beer with him and say, listen, like, <laughs> what do you think about this condo? Because at the end of the day, $9 million, that is a ton of cash, especially again, all of this is taxpayers' money. This is not coming out of some magic bank account that Prime Minister Trudeau runs. It's our money and it's a huge waste. Yeah, you know what? It sounds pretty rough. And I think that there was a big sticker shock for a lot of Canadians when the news broke. Of course, $9 million is outrageous, uh, especially for our residents. Now, the part of this story that doesn't really get told, and I think in order to be fair, it should be mentioned, is the fact that Canada just listed last week the old New York City residents for the Consul General, and they listed it for $13 million. So, you're thinking that global affairs will likely be able to pocket the difference. Will the difference go into something useful? No, it won't. Obviously, I'll be wasted again. But that is an important part of the story. Oh, that, I didn't know that part. That is yeah. really interesting. So so they're 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 selling the $13 million old residence and they they're actually downsizing to a $9 million condominium, believe it or not. And the the story was that there was going to be a 2 million it was going to cost $2 million to renovate the old condo. Or they could buy a $9 million condo, sell the old one, pocket the difference. Here's the way I look at it. In my opinion, it's actually very important for Canada to be able to project diplomatic strength in the mm -hmm. most important city likely in the world, which is New York City, besides maybe Washington, D.C. You actually want the Canadian government to be able to use a residence like this to advance the interests of Canadians. You probably don't. And what the conservatives are arguing is that the whole thing is absurd. They shouldn't have spent any money on it. You don't want them to be in an apartment that is falling apart, that is in need of repairs, or that you end up or you're in a hotel conducting events. The same thing goes with Sussex Drive, 24 Sussex Drive. The way I look at it is the Canadian government, for whatever reason, has decided that, no, they don't want to be the ones to put up the fight to try to save 24 Sussex Drive because taxpayers, it's going to cost the taxpayer too much money. But the symbolism of having 24 Sussex Drive, the residents of the Prime Minister being infested with mice and rats, while the Prime Minister lives in the back lawn of Rideau Hall at a nice home, but it's not really fitting of the office of Prime Minister, is something that I think Canadians should be concerned about. There is a value for projecting influence and strength on the world stage in New York City. I think this is a perfect example of it. And I think many of the people arguing against this are those that would say, actually, we shouldn't be spending any money as well on 24 Sussex because who cares where the prime minister lives? You know, if the government didn't spend 
$17 million, for example, on Indonesian foreign aid, a country that doesn't need it at all. Or maybe we spent a couple, a few less billion dollars on Ukraine into the meat grinder. We could actually save some more taxpayer money and that would have far more influence for Canadians. But I guess the argument will be that we need to, uh, we need to be up in arms over the condo. There's my, <laughs> there's my, there is my opposite side on this story. What do you guys think? I am surprised by your take. Um, although I can see you actually, cause I will say like, I loved Tom Clark as anchor. I thought he did a great job as an anchor and I could picture you. I can picture you as this anchor man. You'd be doing a good job. So me, so maybe you want this gig is what you're saying in 20 well, years time. Maybe the only way a journalist can get into a $9 million apartment is to be the consul general for New York. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> Listen, yeah. I don't want Tom Clark living at the YMCA in Manhattan in his track pants. Okay. I get yeah. that. But I think there's a happy medium. You know, can't he be living in a nice residence upstate, take the train downtown for a lot cheaper and have like a really beautiful office space in New York for cheaper? Although I will say... Selling for 13 and buying for nine, if that's the actual case, that that pl thickens the plot. Noah, you wanted to jump in on this one? Yeah, I think it's very fitting that I'm in between you guys in the frame because I my opinion's probably in between you guys too. <laughs> like I agree with Harrison on the 24 Sussex point. I just think like nine million dollars for a condo, it, it's absurd. I, I think like, you know, if you hold meetings in a hotel that's you know nice and posh and you know you don't have to spend nine million dollars i think that's you know a good alternative you can rent out some nice office space you can rent out a condo for maybe 2.5 million dollars it's not like 2.5 million dollars is a cheap condo you know i don't think i'm going to be able to get anywhere and close to that in my lifetime although maybe i you know win the lottery or become rich in my career so who, who maybe you become but the consul general to new york <laughs> noah come on Dream yeah, big. exactly. You know, I got to aspire to that. We, me and you will uh, compete for that role, Harrison. Yeah, we uh, will. Maybe but, we can you know, trade like, it. We'll take half terms. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But you know, when you're renting a, a condo with uh, Makoba stone floors, you know, a powder room with jewel onyx finishes, uh, a wet bar with cristallo gold quartz zeit, uh, countertops and backsplash, a, a bathroom clad in Italian white venato marble. I mean, you saw my roof, like, you know, I don't got no Italian Venato marble up in here, you know? So, like, I, I don't think that, I don't think that uh, you need to have, like, you know, uh, like, to live like me uh, if you're the consul general. But I also don't think that you need to be living in, you know, the lap of luxury either. I, did you have to practice pronouncing those things? Because I didn't understand half of what you just said. <laughs> I didn't That's practice. Amazing. That's why you didn't understand it. <laughs> That it sounds like very fancy marble. On the real quick point on 24 Sussex, um, 24 Sussex actually isn't really a historical building. Um, it's been around since maybe the 1940s, 1950s. Like it's, it was, and I forget who it was built by. It was like a millwright. So it was some fancy, you know, rich dude had the house built. My point is, is that it was always kind of slapdash added onto over the years. So it wound up being kind of wonky. Um, in fact, I remember when Laureen Harper was in there, when Prime Minister Harper was living in 24 Sussex, she said that she couldn't get a lot of the windows open because they were painted shut. Like it was all sorts of strangeness happening there. And you're right. There's been an aversion to upgrading the thing because the National Capital Commission wastes so much money. That if you give those guys an inch, they will take 10 kilometers and they will waste money doing it. So this is now why we're in this bit of a weird situation where he's on the Rideau grounds. Now, I will say, Harrison, Rideau Cottage is a pretty fancy building. Like, I think it's got 12 bedrooms or something like that. Like, he's not living in a shack. So I think a better spending of taxpayers' money would be to sell the property at 24 Sussex. And the, the area across the street where the prime minister is right now... It's pretty, it's secure. They've already got fences and gates and everything there. Just upgrade that a little bit so that can, he can have international diplomatic meetings and call it a day. I think that might be the smarter way to go for taxpayers. Um, part of my playful side wants to do something fun with like, you know, a Canadian reno show and raise money that way and like turn it into a bingo hall the way Preston Manning had said, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think we should split the difference, sell, sell 24 Sussex, build up Rideau Cottage a little bit and just call it an end of a day. Yeah, I generally believe that just my, my perspective is the Canadian government, Global Affairs Canada wastes out, outrageous amounts of money on foreign aid projects. And these often never get criticized for whatever reason. Maybe it's politically a sensitive topic to address. 
but it's a complete waste for us to be spending money. Now, I don't believe it's a waste for certain projects in Africa, for example, where I believe it's really needed. But Indonesia, $17 million, the amount of money we give to Honduras, for example, it doesn't matter at all to Canada's diplomatic efforts. Having, a, having an important place in the world where all the world leaders meet and they, they can feel like Canada is a serious player, I think is important. And generally, I believe that the residence of the prime minister should be a fitting of the office of the prime minister and the leader of the country. So if it is uh, renovating Rideau Cottage and saying goodbye to 24 Sussex, fair enough. But in my opinion, these things matter. The, these, the, the symbols of the strength of our country and the importance of the government matter uh, far more than the amount of money that we just splash around the world for useless projects, which, end, which ends up going into the pockets of, of leaders, which, which we, did, we believe are enemies of Canada. Right, that's the most absurd. Or, part. or we're paying for a sex toy uh, workshop. I was gonna you know? say, <laughs> well, exactly. You don't even need so, to do. So, yeah. So yeah, let, let's 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 be concerned about the plight of Canadians and the fact that we can actually spend money on our own people, while also making sure that the symbols of our symbols of the state and the importance of the government are are met, and not actually be giving it away to people who don't care about our country and are, are genuinely enemies. We still give a million dollars, or a bit more than a million dollars, to China, for example. I mean, it, 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 it is ridiculous and people want to talk about saving taxpayers money. They should be talking about foreign aid far more than they do about $9 million condos or uh, traveling expenses. I really think that the argument is, is lost if you're not talking about foreign aid. You don't even, like Noah mentioned, even moving past foreign aid, just the absolute waste internationally, like yes. sex toy shows in Germany. Did you know we actually spent taxpayers money in Canada on getting old people to tell their sex stories? overseas like we were contracting out old people sex stories with our money it's just absolutely bizarre the amount of money so now, I don't know. now now i'm, now I'm really afraid story, of... uh, old people sex stories in canada are like just unique uh but you know just needs to be told to the entire world but now now yeah, i'm really yeah, yeah, i'm really right. concerned about where the difference is on this where the difference is going to go on the sale of the old condominium and those few extra million dollars I don't Maybe know. Maybe we'll try a ride can 2.0. Oh. <laughs> they can double that amount. Guys, this has been a delight. Uh, folks, uh, if you have any comments, be sure to hit us up in the comment section there. Send us an email. You can head on over to True North's website and let us know what you think of the show. If you have show ideas, please send them along as well. If you want to argue with any of us about spending $9 million on a condo or Let's what color it. of what color of track pants Tom Clark should wear at the YMCA? Please let us know. Catch us back here next week for more Off the Record. That was pretty solid hosting. I'm thinking we should have a segment uh, every time you're on about, you know, dunking on former colleagues, Chris. <laughs> That's ridiculous. What That's are the odds of that, though? Me. Seriously, I mean, that is... That was weird. That is that is that is a bit unfortunate, but I think it went uh, I think it went very well. Good. If I Chris, were are, are either sure? of those gentlemen, I wouldn't be super mad at me. I think I, I don't was... think so. No, no. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, maybe you hey should man, uh, text Tom doing Clark it. and tell him that uh, you should text Tom Clark and tell him his jobs in peril. I think Polyev said that he would fire him if uh, he gets in office. So you should like let him know in advance that you know he's hey, not going to be living in that condo for much longer. <laughs> Harrison's moving in. <laughs>